I'd love to pray with you and then we'll have God's word. Lord Jesus, what a joy to be here together on Easter Sunday uh, to have the hope of your rising in our hearts. We ask now that your Holy Spirit would indeed make Christ known to us in Scripture and in the breaking of the bread. Amen. So here's the story that only Luke preserves from the second half of Luke chapter 24. That same day, that afternoon, two of them were leaving Jerusalem and traveling seven miles to the west to the village of Emmaus. And as they were walking, they were talking about the things that had happened. And Jesus came alongside them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he asked them, what is this that you're talking about along the way? And they stood still and were sad. One of them, Cleopas, said, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem that does not know the things that have happened? What things, Jesus asked. The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet of God, mighty in word and deed. He was delivered up to the chief priests, and then he was crucified. But we had thought he was the one to redeem Israel. But more than that, it's now the third day since these things happened. And this morning, some women of ours went to the tomb, and finding it empty, they returned, saying they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. One of our company went to check and saw that the body was not there, but him they did not see. Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart, do not the Scriptures teach that the Christ must suffer and after that enter into his glory? And so beginning with Moses and then all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the things concerning himself in the Holy Scriptures. When they arrived at the village of Emmaus, Jesus made as if to go on, but they said to him, stay with us, for the day is now far spent and evening is at hand. So Jesus went in with them. That night at supper, he took the bread, he lifted it up and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within as he taught to us the scriptures along the road? And they arose immediately in that hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they came to the eleven who said to them, The Lord is risen and he has appeared to Simon. And then the two made known to them what they had seen along the road, how Jesus had opened the scriptures to them. This is the word of the Lord. It's a story only Luke has. A story of the afternoon after the morning of resurrection tells us that it wasn't so easy to grasp. There was a lot of confusion. A week before, Jesus has been hailed as the Messiah, the Redeemer. The crowds were with him. Thursday night, he is betrayed, denied by his closest friends. Friday, he was crucified. Saturday was nothing but devastation and despair. And then Sunday morning got worse. The body was gone. The tomb was empty. A further disgrace to their beloved master, except that some women said they had a vision of an angel appearing to them, saying he was risen, but the others didn't see it. It's a lot of anxiety in the air, a lot of questions, a lot of excitement, a lot of wondering, a lot of tumult, and two of the disciples decided, that's enough. We're leaving. They're going to a relative's house. Maybe they're going home, but they're certainly going to get out of Jerusalem. This town is volatile. It's about to explode. There are soldiers everywhere. There's devastation everywhere. We're out of here. Let's get to the country. So they left. Imagine that on Easter Sunday with the word in the air that Christ has risen. You thought it's just too crazy. I got to go someplace sane. So along the way, a stranger comes up to them. It just happens to be Jesus. But the scripture says their eyes were blocked from seeing him. They were closed to who he was. So for two hours, he told them all the scriptures about how the Christ had to suffer before rising from the dead. Can you imagine being part of that Bible study? I think I'd walk slow. Keep talking. Give it to me. Keep talking. And when they arrive at the village, I love this, Jesus, whom they still don't recognize, acts as if he's going to go on further. I'm just going to keep walking into the dark. Next village is fine. And they realize, stay. 
don't go, come in. There's room for you, come in. And I love this, Jesus doesn't play hard to get at all. He's like, okay, I wasn't going to ask, but since you asked, I'll come in. And then when he was a guest, acts like a host, picks up the bread and breaks it, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. So it is that we say Christ is known in Scripture in the breaking of the bread. Well, how long does it take to walk seven miles? A couple hours, depending how fast you're walking or how mountainous the terrain is, how rough the road is. Two hours, about the length of time it takes to do church on Easter Sunday. I know some of you got up at 8.45. I can tell you need to straighten yourselves out. You're trying to shorten the time. But most of you got up, had some breakfast, got dressed. You look great, by the way, very spring and fine. You'll be at church here for an hour, hour and 15 minutes, stay for some coffee, get home, get changed, and in the end, it's about two hours. It's an Emmaus Road walk. That's the distance. And really, this place is abuzz with news of resurrection. The cloth has been changed from purple to white on the cross. There are flowers at the bottom. Guys up front are saying, Christ has risen from the dead. He got up. The band and the choir are singing, Christ has risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. Come awake, come awake. All around you, people are excited with anticipation. We are on the road somewhere taking an Easter journey. And maybe you wonder, so is there something in this for me? Does this story actually affect my story? Is it possible I can be taken up into this greater story, to see what my eyes are closed to right now, but have them opened, to see that when these people are talking about Jesus, He's really there. Then again, it's only two hours, and I don't really like to change. I usually think I can get through church unscathed, unaffected. Well, you can put it on, you can smile, have happy face, church clothes, but normally you can think, well, there's basketball this afternoon, and mom's cooking something good, and there's going to be some egg hunts, and it's going to be nice, and all I got to do is just get through this, and I'll be out of it, back to normal. It'd be great. We have this internal struggle between the hope of, can I be taken up into this story? Will it catch this year? And boy, I hope I don't, hope I can get out of here. I kind of like the way I'm coping. I've learned how to manage the guilt. I sort of like my strategies for dealing with loneliness. Usually they work. I'm pretty good at figuring out how to fill in the emptiness with busyness. I don't want to add something that might disrupt the fine balance because if it's wrong, I'll be a mess. But wouldn't it be great if the guilt could be not just covered but the stain washed clean. Wouldn't it be amazing if the loneliness, even in the middle of the night, could be filled with a presence, a personal presence that tells me I am not alone in the universe? Wouldn't it be wonderful if in the midst of the chaos of the world ever erupting, I could have a hope that wouldn't leave me? It comes a real question walking along the Emmaus Road, the two-hour journey, which is going to end. Jesus is a gentleman. He doesn't invite himself. He doesn't barge into the house. He doesn't assume. He's got lots to do. He makes as if to go on. And if you don't want him, you don't have to have him. Church will be over. You'll go home. Jesus will go on. But the question for us is this. As he makes to move past, as we've had this moment together and he's going on to the next church, the next place, does your heart say, wait, don't go, stay with me. Just a moment longer, stay with me, come in, be here with us, eat with us, come into the home of my life. On the Emmaus Road, can we go from having our eyes closed to having our eyes opened? Really, what I'm talking about here, bottom line is the fact you can come home to Christ. You can reconnect to God in a personal way. 
that moves you from chaos to peacefulness, even though life stays hard, can move you from running from guilt to feeling freely forgiven, even though you still have consequences for what you did. It can move you from feeling disconnected to being part of a fellowship of the compassionate who are organizing to see the world's grief and need and say, let's go tend it, let's wipe tears, let's feed hungry, let's care for them, let's bring them the gospel. You can go from empty living of self to a life charged with purpose, a sense of being significant. For me personally, the scriptures set me on fire. They didn't always, but once the change happened, when I opened the word, it's as if every word is charged with meaning for me. That's the gift of God's spirit. But even more, even more is the sense of personal presence. I feel when I stop running the bottom, deepest level, someone is there and he loves me. You can know that. You can know it more deeply. For the disciples, when they saw the risen Jesus, they didn't recognize him until he opened their eyes through the scriptures and the breaking of the bread. And then they began to talk about it. They began to say, this one that we touched, that we heard, that we saw, he is the Lord, he is the Savior. And then here's where the super miracle happens. Those disciples stopped talking to each other and started talking to other people. And they told the story. We saw a guy. We saw him get crucified. We saw him alive. He spoke to us, and he is the Lord of all, and he is the Savior of the world. And the miracle was people who never saw him believed it. And when they believed it, they felt close to him. Even though they never touched him or smelled him or heard the tenor of his voice, when they heard the gospel story, they were as close to Jesus as the apostles were. That's the miracle. Apostle John tells us what we have seen, what we have heard, we've made known to you so that you might have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. The Christian mystical miracle is that when the story is told, we can enter fellowship with the risen Jesus. We can know Him. Now, I can only tell you about it. I can't make you believe it. In fact, you can't make you believe it. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Faith is the gift the Holy Spirit bestows upon us that we might see Jesus in His Word and His sacrament. Faith's the gift. Faith is also a choice. It summons us to lay hold of it and grasp Jesus in our hearts with all that we are and say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I want my eyes opened. I want to come awake out of death and into life. I want you. Stay, don't go. Stay. Stay with me. Like I said, I can't make you believe it, but the witness of the church century after century is that when the story is told and the witnesses bear witness, the Holy Spirit does His work and people come to faith. So all I can do is ask you, is the Holy Spirit creating faith in your hearts right now? Do you feel him stir? The disciples said, weren't our hearts burning within when he told us his word? They were on the edge of expectation. They were filled with anticipation. Is this what we've been longing for? It is. It is. Another 30 minutes, you're on the way home unscathed, safe. Back to your own coping mechanisms. Back to your own self-salvation strategies. Say to him, don't go. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand. The day is far spent. The day of my life is far spent. I don't know if I have another hour or another minute. Time is passing. Things are getting away from me. Jesus, don't go. This day, be with me. It's a condition of complete simplicity, said T.S. Eliot costing not less than everything, because everything to me is my hands on the wheel. And it's taken them off and say, Jesus, you drive. 
because it's my hands turning the lock to all the doors in my house. And it's saying, Jesus, it's unlocked. You come in, not just to the living room, which I tidied up for today's guests. Come to the bedroom and the closet. Come in, because you alone are life. If the Holy Spirit is stirring faith in you, I urge you, don't wait. Grasp it with both hands of your heart. When you come to the table today, come as one saying, Lord, come into my life. As the bread goes down, you come in and make yourself known. Fill me, flood me, make your home in me so that when I'm with you, I feel home. Jesus, don't go, stay. And then talk to somebody about it. Stay close. Stay in worship. Stay in Bible study. Get connected. We have a prayer room just down and to the left. There'll be people there you can pray with. But most of all, understand this is the way he said to do it. If you've got trust in Jesus, if you want him, this is what he's provided for you. Eat the bread. Drink the cup. Say yes with all your hearts. Stay. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for evening is at hand and the day is far gone. Be known to us, we pray, in Scripture and the breaking of the bread. Kindle in our hearts a flame for you. Open our eyes to compassion. Lord Jesus, make your home with us, for we would never leave you. Amen.